when I look <laughs> and looked at the assignment that I got for this evening, I wanted to say, are you sure you want me to talk about rejoicing? You know how I am. I mean, uh, rejoicing, that's not something you look at academically. I don't know how to look at rejoicing academically. David didn't know how to look at it academically. David did it. He was involved in it. I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Do you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God? I do, but I sometimes wonder if some other folks do because some of them look as delighted as a firefly that backed into an electric fan. <laughs> delighted. Explain it to her. I mean, he backed into and it. Never mind. <laughs> I, I just wonder where it was that you got your attitude. Now, I know where you got your salvation, but I wonder where you got your attitude. I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, I wasn't looking for God. I wasn't looking for his glory. Didn't grow up in church. Twelve years old, I went to buy some strawberries, and the owner of the strawberry patch happened to be an elder at Diamond Grove Christian Church, where you all met last year. Remember that place? It was a different place. They tore it down and built another one, but that's another story. He asked me, why don't you come to church on Sunday? And I didn't know why. And so I said we would. Went home and told my mother what I'd done. And so we started going. After seven months, I'm minding my own business. Sitting, you know, pretty far back. Not quite on the back row, but close enough. We're singing the song, invitation song. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. I'm minding my own business. Got my nose in my hymn book where it belongs, not looking up at nobody. When I feel the firm hand of my mother on my right arm, who marched me down to the front of the auditorium, where the preacher asked me, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God? Well, I didn't know no better, so I said yes. Because I'd heard it was true for the last seven months. After a week of studying Scripture about what the Bible says about baptism, I was immersed into the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't looking for God, but He found me. I wasn't looking for his glory, but his glory found me. After a while, we moved to Carl Junction. For a year and a half, I was a member of the Carl Junction Christian Church, where you are assembled this evening. After a year and a half, we moved back on to Diamond Grove Prairie, where Thursday night at a revival meeting, our family came forward. We thought we ought to place our membership back so people knew where we were came and stood this side. Preacher asked us to sit down. Invitation hymn closed. Asked the people to sit down. They did. Then he leaned over to me. Now why he leaned to me? I have no idea. My father was sitting here. My mother was here. I had a brother and a sister and me and a brother and a sister. He leaned over to me and asked me why we'd come forward. He said, mm -hmm. I said to him, we've come forward to place our membership back in this congregation and again begin to work with this church. What I did not know was, Alan Keller was deaf in one ear. Do you know which ear I got? He straightened up and announced to the congregation that the Souder family had come forward to rededicate themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and that Gordon had come forward to pledge himself to the preaching ministry. <laughs> if I had the goal then that I have now, I'd have stood up and said, this preacher tells lies. I never said any such thing. But I was trapped because I was an introvert in a society where what mom said went, where what da dad said went, where what the elders said went, what the preacher said, well, I was trapped. I was 16. I suffered through three years of high school, and then the crunch came. Because everybody had made up their minds what he's going to be. 
Well, what's that going to do? I stuck. I thought, well, I guess if I'm going to have to do this thing, I better go find out what it is. And so I enrolled in Ozark Bible College, as it was called at the time. At the end of the second year, after I'd completed a course called homiletics, that's supposed to be the art of preaching, and I was doing my last sermon, preaching on the book of Revelation, of all things, why he assigned us that, I'll never know, but I had one of the churches, one of the seven churches. And when I finished, the professor looked up and said, is that it? I said, yes. I had spoken for about seven or eight minutes. That was it. At the end of four years in that institute, I mean in that college, <clears throat> all the guys in my class, all the male students were out preaching, making money at it. I mean, they was making 20 and 30 and $40 going out on the weekends preaching. I was making 18 working hard on a farm, seven, uh, you know, that's 24-7. I'm just working really hard. I thought, this is a deal. I'm going to get in on this. And so... I applied, and they said, come on up. And so for four months, I preached. I won't tell you where it was. <clears throat> I preached for four months, after which they sent me a letter which said, please don't come back anymore. I didn't. But I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, they found out what I already knew. I couldn't preach. At the end of my fifth year <laughs> I went back I still try this got to, I, if I'm going to do it I got to find a house done so they had a four year degree I went for five took everything they had and two weeks before graduation the president calls me into his office and says Gordon there's a black mark against your mark you may not graduate but I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God they did straighten it out by the way I, I do have a degree if that's important to you <clears throat> then I went to the mission field spent 12 years on the mission field starved out had to withdraw because I couldn't support my family but I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God do you rejoice in the hope of the glory of God what does it take for you to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God Perhaps you don't rejoice because you've seen a hint of it in this preaching series and it scares you silly. Or perhaps you're still confused about it. After all, if you read the letter of Paul to the Romans, before you get to what we have numbered chapter 5, where our text is, which says, Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You've already read chapter 3. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In our attempts to present the gospel of salvation, we quickly skip over chapter 4 and chapter 5 so we can get to chapter 6 where it says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I understand our rush to get from sin and falling short so as to arrive at eternal life, but if you rush too fast, you will miss the earlier uses of our rejoice word that is found here in 5.2, because it has already occurred in 3.27 where it says, where's the boasting? Now trust me, it's the same word here. In chapter 1, Paul has graphically <laughs> shown the ways in which Gentiles fall short of God's glory. And in chapter, uh, chapter 2, the Jews get two chapters. <laughs> I mean, he could wipe out the Gentiles, just one chapter. But it takes two chapters for him to show his own people, the children of Israel, how they too have fallen short. At verse 17 in chapter 2, Paul nails his Jewish brothers using our rejoice word. He says, if you call yourself a Jew and you rely on the law and boast, now it's our word, that word boast, and boast of your relationship to God, will you teach yourself also? He concludes his assessment to the Jews in 3.27. What becomes of boasting? It's excluded, yeah. 
So right now, I'm getting discouraged about our rejoice word. <laughs> the translations have tried to take off some of the pressure by using boast in some of the earlier context, but it's still the same word where we say rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, just in case Paul's readers should try to escape his argument by claiming to be Abraham's children, Abraham being before the law, he slams shut that door too. In 4.2, he asserts, if Abraham has justified by works, he has something to boast about. Here's our rejoice word, but not before God. King James uses glory there in this line about Abraham. Now, are you ready to give up yet? <laughs> are you discouraged yet? All right, good. Because that's the great thing about turning the page to chapter 5. Our rejoice word is used here and not translated boasting, but rejoicing. Now, when I started to read for this assignment, I expected to find Cairo. Not Egypt, but that funny word that the Greek professors uh, know all about. As our rejoice word. It is a frequently used word. It means rejoice. It means be glad. It's even used as a form of address, like good morning. How are you? I'm glad to see you. But instead, I found our rejoice word to be kahomatha, which means boast, glory, pride, or reason for boasting. Paul had expostulated to the believers in Asia, far be it from me to glory. It's our word to rejoice except in the cross of Jesus Christ our Lord. I have nothing to boast about except the cross. I have nothing to boast about but the work that God does in me. I have nothing to boast about but His Spirit in me. I have nothing to boast about except the hope of the glory of God. And so, <laughs> I rejoice. Let's have a party. <laughs> it's time to celebrate. And you'll rejoice too. When you see three glories, three splendors of God that I want to point out to you. Number one. Now, are there children here this evening? If you're back there, kids, you've got to draw pictures for me so that the parents can understand this. You first, you draw a mountain, and you'll see you later why I want you to draw a mountain. I first want you to hear the word of the Lord from Exodus 19. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain quakes greatly. And the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Ugh. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Now continue with me in Exodus 20, where God speaks the Ten Commandments, which are the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. They came to be kept in a golden box called the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. That's why it's called the box or the Ark of the Covenant because the covenant was kept in this golden box. At the conclusion of God speaking aloud the Ten Commandments, His covenant with the children of Israel, the people had a response. Now when all the people perceived the thunderings and the lightnings and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoke, smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood afar off and said to Moses, You speak to us. We'll hear, but don't let God speak to us lest we die. Are you sure you want to deal with this business of the glory of God? They weren't so sure. Now that was splendor. That was glory. More glory than they could stand. Now hear the word of the Lord again, not from Moses, but from Jesus' apostle named Paul. In his second letter to the Corinthian believers, he said, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ 
toward God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything is coming from us. Our competence is from God, who made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant. Not written, not in a written code, but in the Spirit. For the written code kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the dispensation of death carved in letters of stone came with such splendor that the Israelites could not look on Moses' face because of its brightness, fading as it was, will not the dispensation of the Spirit be attended with greater splendor? Amen. If what faded away came with splendor, what is more permanent, what is permanent must have much more splendor. Now, I just wonder if you really believe Paul. Do you see that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, is not Genesis through Malachi? Genesis was written before the Old Covenant. It can't be in the Old Testament. It precedes it. First 19 chapters of Exodus aren't even in the Old Testament. They precede it. Now, do you also understand that even though you've been told this from your early Sunday school experiences, Genesis is not in the Old Testament? Here's the one that's going to bother you the most. Do you understand that the New Testament, the New Covenant, is not Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, down to the Revelation? Do you understand that the Old Covenant was written on tablets of stone and the apostle of hers, that the New Covenant is written not on pages, but upon the heart of the believer in blood. Amen. I'm glad you know that. I'm glad you understand that because most folks that I speak to about that, their eyes go, wow, never heard that before. This New Covenant is not written on stone. It's not written with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God Amen. on human hearts. Amen. Do you see any glory on your heart? Do you see the glorious writing that God is doing by His Holy Spirit on your heart? Is there thunder? Is there lightning? Do you hear a trumpet blast? Is there smoke and fire like a blast furnace? Does the trumpet get louder and louder? Do you hear God speaking? According to Paul, it should be better than that. More glorious. Far more glorious than that. It must far exceed it in splendor. For if there was splendor in the dispensation of condemnation, the dispensation of righteousness must far exceed it in splendor. Amen. And I read ahead to chapter 8 in Romans. Oh, <laughs> I believe that there is more about a Christian's glory to be embraced. We know that in everything God works for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And that those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Amen. Yes. Do you see that? You've been called, you've been justified, you've been glorified. Now what do you say to that? Here's what Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now all three words, called, justified, glorified, are in the past tense what Greek professors call the aorist tense. I have no idea what the word aorist means. I just go for past tense. You, <laughs> don't help me none. I got none. Don't take my time. You've had yours. I'm going <laughs> to. He, <laughs> he said that these are things that have passed. You have been glorified. Oh, yes, there's more to come in the resurrection. I know that. Paul has already said, we wait for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. But even now, we have been glorified. 
if you think that's marvelous, consider the second glory that I rejoice in, which is this. Now, kids, on this one, you want to draw a throne. First one is a mountain. Now you draw a throne. I rejoice in the splendor that we now sit with him in heavenly places. The, the assertion of Paul in Ephesians 2.6. Now, reputable commentators, even acquaintances of mine, indicate that even though it's written in past tense form, that surely it belongs to the future. Brother, I trust the apostles over my friends. I'm going to take their word for it. If you are alive in Christ, hear the assertions of the Apostle Paul in this Ephesians text. He says in verse 5, even when you were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. Second, he asserts, he raised us up with him in verse 6. And then he says also in verse 6, he made us sit. That's past tense. He made us sit with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Where are you sitting tonight? Where do you sit? When you're at home and you're sitting down, where do you sit? Uh, there are some places you shouldn't sit, you know. There are some places you ought not to sit because it's not a heavenly place. Watch where you sit. My mom always said, watch what you say. And in Bible college, they said, watch what you look at. But I'm telling you, watch where you sit. As participants in the new covenant, Paul and his fellow apostles, his fellow preachers, had the sure hope that it was a permanent, irrevocable covenant, never to be superseded and never to be surpassed in splendor. This accounted for their boldness and their confidence in their preaching. They had nothing to conceal but every reason for fearless candor. Don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death? We have been raised to walk in a newness of life. If you've been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above because your life is hid with Christ in God. What I'm going to say next may sound critical, and I'm sorry, but it's critical. <laughs> we seem to try hard these days to convince sinners that we empathize with them. Over and over, I hear in church, we're all just sinners. We even sing of our weaknesses. Now, I do not deny that we are sinners saved by grace, but I tell you bluntly that if I were an unsaved sinner, I would not be looking for the fellowship of sinners. Amen. I certainly wouldn't go to church looking for the fellowship of sinners. I could find the fellowship of sinners at any hangout. They're all over town. And if you don't like your town, go where they hang out some other place in town. I tell you what, I think that I'd be looking for the fellowship of the glorified. I'd be looking for the ones who have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Relating to sinners takes no effort at all. So were some of you, the apostle said, after he listed a terrible vile list of ways to sin to the Corinthians. I'm sorry he brought it up. I'm, I, you know, the business of how you can sin, I, it bothers me sometimes because, you know, I, I've noticed children. I play with my grandchildren, and I'm known for playing with their minds, too. We had a nice dinner, Finished off with some very nice, I love banana, good banana. Just, just before the spots really turned brown, you know, just good banana. We had a good banana. And so when I finished with my banana, I turned to my grandson, who's 11 years old, and I said, now, Matthew, never put banana peels in the refrigerator. He had never thought of doing that. He nearly drove his mom and dad crazy. Why does Papa say, never put banana peels in the refrigerator? So Paul lists all these things, and I worry about it because, you know, well, I hadn't thought of doing that one. I'll try that one. <clears throat> Just hadn't thought about it. I tell you this. 
It is relating to God that takes concentration. It doesn't take much concentration to relate to sinners. But seated with Christ, we are being transformed into his likeness. Now let's turn to the third reason I rejoice. This time draw a crown. First was a mountain. Second was the throne. Now we're going for the crown. I rejoice in the splendor that is to come. We got splendor now. We got glory. There's splendor to come. Our hope of sharing the glory of God. Are you going to share the hope of the glory of God? I asked somebody and they said, well, I hope so. I said, your, answer, your words are right, but your tone is all wrong. <laughs> hope is a mixture of earnest desire and sure expectation. Yeah. Hope mixed with uncertainty is not hope at all. Right. Hope that is comprised of desire and expectation brings peace. Desire alone brings agitation. Expectation alone brings anxiety. But desire and expectation together bring peace, a state of mind that enables confident activity that presses into the future with purpose. Amen. Are you going to share in the glory of God? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I know what that means. Is it just me? Or do you get the impression that rejoicing is not the first response that people generally have to the concept of the second coming and the hope of the glory of God? Do you think that that's usually the first response? It seems to me that prophecy preaching in general has left people in a state of fear and agitation and anxiety instead of rejoicing. I had her print a couple of sheets for me. One said the great tribulation on one side. On the other side, it said the Antichrist. I said, do you want a copy of this? She said, no, I don't want to know. I'd like to teach you sometime about that because there's a lot of malarkey being spread about that. <clears throat> Another woman spoke to me in tears of her fears at the very thought of the second coming. So deep is her agitation that before she and I talked, she used to become physically ill. I mean sick to her stomach, go and throw up because of what prophecy preaching had done to her mind and her spirit. You think she's rejoicing? I loved it this morning when, was it this morning, one of the fellows said that, you know, it's just hard. It is difficult, I think. It is difficult to articulate some of our feelings. See, I understood what he said better if he said, I just feel so good I could bust. That, now that I can understand. I, that's just the way I get to feeling. I don't feel like crying about it. I get to feeling so good about it. I'm gonna, there's some days I just want to cut my suspenders and go straight up. Lord, let's bring it on. Let's do it now. Amen. You don't wear suspenders, you're not going up. Is it, in your view, a beneficial activity to move from fear to rejoicing in our hope of the glory of God? Now, there is a natural response to God's glory that you need to be aware of. We read about it in Exodus 19. The Israelites were afraid and trembled. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, he said, Woe is me, for I am undone. Ezekiel fell on his face when he saw the throne and the one that was on it. Daniel fell on his face in a deep sleep with his face on the ground when he saw this. Even the writer of the Revelation letter, the Apostle John, when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet as though he were dead. Now that's a natural response. But now, after you've fainted and fallen down dead, is there anything in you that will raise you up to rejoice in the glory of God? What do you know that can do that for you? Well, you know what Jesus said. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. You know what Paul said. 
Our Lord Jesus Christ will change our lowly body to be like His glorious body. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. You know what Peter said. When the chief shepherd appears, you will obtain the unfading crown of glory. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself establish, restore, strengthen you. You know what Jude said. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you without blemish before the presence of his glory with rejoicing to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty and dominion and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Now since you know that, since you know that, give up the fear. Give up the anxiety. Give up the uncertainty. Give up the left behind series. Oh, uh, don't get me started. <laughs> Quit looking for the great tribulation. You've missed it by 1,500 years. Stop trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. John said there's all kinds of them. There were some in his day, and there'll always be somebody walking around who's opposed to Jesus. Start rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. Now I've got to tell you, I am mundane. I am of this world. I am of Adam's race, created of the dust from the ground. Our whole race is under condemnation because of sins of disobedience. When a mundane person, a person of planet Earth, sees the glory of God, there are three appropriate responses to make. Number one, perceive the glory because the eyes of some are blinded by the God of this world. Open your eyes, Lord, and help me to see. Open my ears and help me to listen. The glory of God is all around you. I would hate to be a scientist and an atheist at the same time and have to confront all of the contradictions to my theories with what I see out there because the glory of God is all around you. You cannot, I mean, every time you walk out the door, there it is, the glory of God. You can't even go into your own bedroom and find yourself alone except, I looked at myself, there, the glory of God. All around you is displayed the glory of God. I'd hate to be an archaeologist these days because the digger they deep, a little more likely they find the face of God. I'd hate to be an astronomer these days. The further you look, the more likely to find the face of God. I'd hate to be an anthropologist these days because the more you understand about man, lo and behold, he's made in the image of God. You just keep finding God all over the place, upside down and around. Second, acknowledge the glory. Don't suppress the truth about God's glory revealed in the creation, Paul said in Romans 1. Third response. Respond to the glory. Go to the glory. Run to the glory. Don't run from it. Run to the glory. Now these three responses when combined are called giving God the glory. So, I'm a mundane man who has seen the glory. Now I rejoice in the glory. I rejoice in the Hope of the glory of God because the glory of the new covenant of which I am now living by faith in the Son of God, having been adopted into that glory, I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because I see it in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I rejoice in the hope of glory of God because I know there's even more glory to come. I couldn't preach. I couldn't even walk down the aisle by myself. 
turned down. It seemed like every door was closed to any kind of opportunity. But I've seen the glory. We are now being changed into his likeness from one degree of...